Hey, so uh, my uncle came to visit last weekend. He got a flight on some new discount airline that only caters to senior citizens. Did you guys know that even existed? Uh, I, I, didn't. I didn't. I had never heard no. of Incontinental Airlines. Oh, my God. I think they had their, their premier flight a little while ago under Delta. <laughs> Does this have anything to do with the open AI oh. brownout? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Delta Airlines Overflow Lounge. I'm Carl Franklin. That's <laughs> Dwayne LaFlotte and Patrick Hines. You're listening to Security This Week, of course. How are you guys? Good. Good. Yeah, fantastic. How about you? I can't complain. How are things? I think highly of myself all the time. Some uh, <laughs> <laughs> some big things happened in GPT land uh, this week after their conference, including some something bad that happened for a couple hours but we'll talk about that later that's later yeah we'll talk about that later first what's the first story cvss cvss who wants it so see if so so people probably have heard if they've heard us talk they've heard us talk about cv scores the common vulnerability scoring system Mm -hmm. um has been out for a while and for eight years we've been using version three of that standard right and they use this to keep track of and rate exploits that come up. Right. So whether it's a C- CVE 7 or a 9 or a 10 is supposed to give us an indication of how severe, uh, bad it is. Yeah. How severe, how dangerous. I, I don't really, I think they've had a few misses in that regard, yeah. but that's another point. But now they've released version 4, the next generation. Does, do they, does it go to 11 now? <laughs> I, uh, I, not now, but no. eventually it'll go to 11. So we're stuck with no. Bo Derek forever, apparently. We are. Just a 10. Just a 10. She, what is she, like 100 years old now? <laughs> you think she might be a 9? <laughs> Maybe. Think she's she's dead. Dead. No. She, did, no. I thought, didn't she die? Oh, that would be terrible. <laughs> she's like Elizabeth Hurley. She's She looks like she's 35 forever. Uh, I'm sorry uh, if she's dead. That was completely yeah. insensitive on my part. Insensitive. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's insensitive on my Anyways. part. She's not dead. She's only 66. Really? Oh, there you go. What? Yeah. Wow. Now you go to apologize for thinking she was old enough to be dead. Wow. Everyone's old enough to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a security Especially show? you. Or what? Especially you. Right now. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Weren't we talking about CVSS scores? Uh, yes. Yeah. So actually, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. That If you've listened to sort of historically one of how you. we've- I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) I love scoring and metrics. Uh, No, if you like, if you've listened to this show before, we we always look at these and we go, "Oh, well, this is a remote code execution. It's an RCE, but they only rated it as a seven. Why? Or Mm. this is a priv a priv ask, Mm -hmm. right?" And you're like, "Ah, whatever. You have to like the the moons have to align, and there's no way it's ever going to happen." But then it comes up a ten, and we're like, "What's going on?" Right. Um. So I think this new system has quite a bit more granularity built into it uh if you so you're saying it takes into account um how how probable it is that this will happen in the first yes. place not just yeah, how destructive absolutely. it is once I, mm-hmm. it sounds like they listened to security this week well one can only <laughs> heard our right. heard our complaining right. Suck. that brings our <laughs> listeners to two <laughs> two <laughs> uh, but the other thing that's that's cool is they're also bringing in more metrics around different types of technology Mm -hmm. so iot for example which is internet of things Mm -hmm. your refrigerators that are connected online and your air conditioners and your dryers and whatever that's all iot devices and cameras and that sort of thing yeah um but they're also bringing in things like ot and ics Mm. so ot is operational technology okay which is everything that runs uh water treatment plants power grids that sort of stuff um, all the way down to um, industrial control systems or ICS. Mm. Um, and ICS are things that run uh, trains, planes, boats. Uh, those are all generally. I thought you were uh, going to say automobiles. I thought so too. But that's good. I was, but Glad no, you, you know what? I left it off. We could have turned it no. into Windows those aren't XP pillows. runs automobiles. <laughs> those aren't pillows. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, we've just shown that we are the older demographic now. Mm. I know. All the millennials are going, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I'm I'm excited. I think this this is actually going to bring quite a bit of. I mean, one of the things that's important here is it, when when this score is what a lot of people use as the basis to whether they should fix a problem or not. Right. Right. Whether you should focus on the problem or not, and if it's not granular enough to actually let us know what the risk is then people stop following it. So I think, honestly, this is going to be really good. I, I think there should be two scores. I think there should be one for the risk of getting it, mm. you know, mm-hmm. of, of be, being attacked or becoming a victim of it. And then or being used. Yeah, yeah. And then another one for the severity of it. So therefore, you could weigh both of those, like a number that just kind of wraps a middle. I actually agree. Mm. The middle of those. I mean. Well, if you look at like Ebola. You're very mm. unlikely to get it, but the impact is really high mm. if you do. Yeah. It's, and the it's cold, a 10 if you get it. And the cold, you're very likely to get it, but if you get it, it's not so bad. Right. And it's not that big a deal. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Ebola would be a 10, a 9.9 on the impact scale. On the scale. depth scale. Right. <laughs> but it would be a, like a a, 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 fa, a th- 2 on the you're likely to get it scale. And then a cold would be like a nine on the you're likely to get it yeah. and a two on the damage scale. So I, yeah, I think it's a damage. Maybe well, we need I, a damage and a and a, a, risk. And a threat. Yeah, likely a yeah, risk scale. So moral of the story: <laughs> wash your hands after you poop. Right? <laughs> Employees must Wait, wash it, hands uh, before returning to the kitchen. <laughs> it's a pretty simple right. strategy. Right. I <laughs> uh, did. Does that relate to digital? Do you have to wash your hands after playing with a virus? I don't know. Maybe. Malware. You touch malware. <laughs> you have to re- refresh your phone. Dwayne, you should be <laughs> right. washing your hands every hour on the uh, hour. Every hour. Scrub that PC. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is good. Yes, this, this will be good. good. This is good. Better. This is good. good. Yeah, this, Better, this, but we need... A lot of the stories numbers. in this week are, are good stories. They're good stories. For example... New Microsoft Exchange, Zero Day. That's a great story. Da- both of them, Zero Days, allow RCE and data theft attacks. How awesome is this, Dwayne? This one's so awesome. And I love these style attacks. You know what's funny is I, I, I go back sometimes and listen to this podcast, and I, it sounds like I love all the attacks, and I do. I do love all the attacks. All right. On a scale from one to awesome. But this one's fantastic. What is this? Oh, uh, this one's like, a, I, I would rate this one as a... Uh, just one under awesome. So no, they all require awesome. they all require authentication for exploitation. They do, but but honestly, authentication into an exchange. All right, let's so let's back up. Good point. They do need authentication. We'll come back to. We're going to table that mm-hmm. just for a second. Um, and this is this is hosted or just self hosted? Is this cloud? This is this. Well, they don't specify, but it's usually on prem. Mm-hmm. It's usually usually they're attacking on prem servers. Um, when they're doing this. Because they're easier to attack. So this is, you're hosting your own exchange server, um, everything's happy, and someone can can breach your exchange server by using poor, uh, you know, usernames and passwords. Mm. So not poor usernames, but poor passwords. Mm-hmm. We've seen this before where, you know, d- d- people go, oh, but you have to be authenticated. So now the, the, the score on this is a one. Who cares? Like Microsoft in this particular case said, eh, not important, mm-hmm. right? Um, because you have to be authenticated, we really don't care. Um, so they're we're not worried about it. Is kind of what they were saying. Prioritizing this very low. We'll get to um, okay. right, and 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 the um, the team ZDI that discovered this was like, no, 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 no this is this is big. Mm. Like, if any, if you get a username and password where you can authenticate to an exchange server. You can literally take over the exchange server. You can steal data. There's all sorts of things you can do inside there um, with what they call, uh, it's a remote code execution, but the, the remote code execution is a deserialization attack. Huh. These are fun uh, attacks. So deserialization attack as, um, you know, yeah, we've talked about right? these before. We have, yeah. When you pass data around, from different layers of an application. Mm-hmm. It could be front end, back end, could be from the back end to the database layer, whatever it is. Usually, before you used to just pass around strings, and then we started passing around objects. Right. And to pass around an object, like let's say we run a, I don't know, we run an auto mechanic shop, mm-hmm. and um, user goes to the website and puts in all the information about their car and clicks save. Mm-hmm. Well, we might create a car object. Mm-hmm. Right. What? What was the make? What was the model? What's the mileage? Make, model, color. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Et cetera. Et cetera. Et cetera. We put that in an object, but now we want to pass that object to the back end so we can store that information in the database. So we would serialize. How it. many machine guns into- are in the front? 
armor plating. I'm sorry, or that was no. Patrick. That was Patrick's car. Now you're talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, man. Lasers. Knives now. that we're, pop out the side. Move up to lasers. If I'm going to have a nuclear reactor in that thing, I'm going to use a laser. <laughs> <laughs> nuclear reactor. That, oh, never mind. Nuclear powered <laughs> laser. All right, so you're getting to serialization. So instead of taking that yes. object, which is this binary representation in memory, you you serialize it into text, which is a text Correct. representation of the data in that object, and you can turn it back into an object once you pull it out of the database. Exactly. So you say, okay, well, that's not a big deal. But let's say on the back end, we have this one big mm -hmm. API that absorbs car object. Mm -hmm. But it also absorbs a truck object mm -hmm. and a bus object and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, you know what? I don't know what object I'm going to be rematerializing on the back end. I'm just going to accept any object. Mm. So what happens here is when you that's attack very convenient. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Patrick's just going to, you need a shirt or something. Yeah. That says it's that. convenient. Convenient. Yeah. Um, so what lady. happens here is the, the attacker then creates an object that in the, either the constructor usually of the object um, runs system code, actually runs an executable uh, system command. So when the object gets rematerialized on the back end, the constructor for that object gets called during the rematerialization, which then will run system code. Does the bidding of the hacker. See, now, as a C-sharp software developer, I have never seen uh, uh, the code serialized and deserialized. Only the data. So I didn't even know that was possible. Is that like, I think we yeah. talked about this before. Is it JavaScript code that's that can be serialized? No, 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 no. Um, you can do JavaScript code, yeah, um, but you you also, most web platforms, depending on how the backend is absorbing the objects, most of them can be exploited this way. Mm. If you're doing generic reserialization of an object, rehydration of an object, mm -hmm. and you don't know what that object's going to be, then I can call all sorts of system commands. Heck, even in C Sharp, I could say, well, I'm going to now import, you know, system.io. Does James and Newton King know about this? <laughs> it's like taking input and not knowing what the input's supposed to be four, yeah. and therefore yes. you you can't yep. say that it's not valid. So it it's treated as valid even though it's doing something nefarious. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. Um, so I I love these types of attacks because it's it's an interesting way to manipulate the system to get it to do your bidding is these serialization deserialization attacks. So they have a total of uh, four attacks here. Uh, one is a remote code execution with a um, chain serialization binder deserialization attack. Sounds yummy. Um, I know, right? Mm. Mm. Chain serialization binders. A sprinkle of Parmesan um, cheese on there. For the second course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Little fava beans. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. It's like that's the only reference to fava beans in the entire it's the history of TV and and movies. Now you clearly don't watch Iron Chef. So, <laughs> I have not watched Iron Chef. I am aware that fava beans need to be deshelled and it's a long process uh -huh. and if you give somebody fava beans in a competition they're going to be sit, spending their cursing the whole time. I I don't even know what a fava bean is. It's a big lima bean looking thing. It's something I won't eat. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, all right, little side little side story. Every time I go out to eat with patrick he eats like a five-year-old like honestly with the he'll cow. say yeah a five -year -old no, they'll be like cow. they'll be like uh, <laughs> sir <laughs> is your peanut butter and jelly i'm a no, little no, bit they'll be better like, than will ferrell and elf a little bit better than that yeah not much not much they'll be like hey uh with your burger sir would you like uh lettuce and tomatoes he's like no that's what that's food, what eats. food eats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my standard ores is, is a, a burger with extra cheese, medium rare, no lettuce, no tomato, no onion, no pickle, no healthy. No healthy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people do actually listen to the show for the security information, believe it or not. What? Uh, it's no. right. What's wrong I'm with safe. these people? I'm safe. They can't poison me with that E. coli stuff. <laughs> I'm not eating the lettuce. Uh... <laughs> On that note, uh, needless to say, Microsoft at this point will fix these issues. Um, mm. However, if you are running an on-prem exchange server, you want to make sure you have really good usernames and passwords to make sure somebody can't get in and run this. Hey, if you're if you're running if you're running an on-prem exchange server, lean into the speaker right now. Lean in. I got something. Please, for you. 
We've got hey, some hey, what the hell are you doing? Quit it. Stop that. So I held on as long as was practical. Yeah, you did. To running exchange on Prem. I did. We we did it for a, yeah. a longer than Dwayne was comfortable doing it. Richard Campbell did too. Oh my God. I twitched every day. And it's been yes. years now since we switched because yes. it just became untenable. They were yeah. just, the problem is, as Dwayne said, they will fix. Mm. They didn't fix. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that yep. means it's still vulnerable. Mm. But you know what's I, I love about it? I love about Microsoft. Usually these types of bugs are fixed immediately, if not close to immediately, in the cloud. If you're using Office of course, 365 yeah. in their hosted version, they're really good at like, oh, I see, you know, this IP address attacking this one customer, mm-hmm. boom, block for everybody. Yeah. But you're running it on-prem and they're like, oh, sorry, yeah. you're not in our cloud, right. so have a nice day. Oh, we estimate um, we have five users in the world running, still running Exchange. Yeah, they can wait. <laughs> they can yeah. wait. Uh, yeah. I, or I, they I, could move I to wish, the cloud. I wish it were different. I really liked having my own exchange servers so that I could have control. I could do it was convenient, all sorts of wasn't it? Redundancy yeah. things. It wasn't convenient. No. It was never convenient, but it at least was secure. Oh my god, it was always a pain in the butt. But it became untenable. Yeah. It became untenable, and I really don't recommend it. If even if you don't go to Microsoft as your cloud. Mm. The cloud vendors, emails moving to the cloud, whether we like it or not. And I went kicking and screaming, but I went a while ago. Mm. So please reevaluate if you're running on-prem. On-prem email servers of any kind, make sure you're getting top-notch services. And right now- Or just stop. Based on this, Microsoft's just not yeah. doing it. and monitoring. Sell it for junk. You know what else is fantastic about this story? Um, ZDI was like, hey, Microsoft, this is kind of really important, right? We, we really should fix this. And Microsoft's like, eh. At some point, so ZDI's like, you know what? Seeing we can't get an official uh, score, like a CVSS uh, 2013-whatever number, we're just going to make up our own. <laughs> so they have, this is uh, ZDI. filed under ZDI-23. ZDI? It's the name the, of their company. Oh, oh, oh. That's the Zero, <laughs> the zero day, day, initiative. day Initiative. It's Micro Trend. Yeah, it's Trend Micro. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's Trend, Trend Micro. micro. So, zero Day Initiative. So ZDI, put, they put it under the ZDI tag. Wow. Um, which is cool. Good for them. Good for them. Right. And, and in the article that we're, the Bleeping Computer article, it says specifically, despite Microsoft acknowledging the reports, its security engineers decided the flaws weren't severe enough to guarantee immediate servicing, postponing the fixes for later. ZDI disagreed, and that's mm-hmm. where we get this disclosure before fix so yeah. um yep. Dwayne, if you were a hacker how would you attack this uh well it's criminal <laughs> this is pretty simple children um we're gonna password spray your uh office or your your exchange installation we're gonna find a valid username and password we're gonna log in or you credential stuff you might credential stuff or we could credential stuff absolutely maybe what we'll do is a little bit of uh phishing have you Let's clicked on something them. and get get credentials, get credentials that way? There's so many methods for us to steal these usernames and passwords. Don't get saucy with me, Bernays. I have cannoli stuffed, <laughs> but I've never credential stuffed. <laughs> okay, so password spraying. We have a big list of users for your company. Yeah. Not hard to get. We have a big list of passwords. We put them together, and then we try oh. and log in as many many times as possible. And sometimes there's mitigations against that. Mm. Um, Is this something Milton funny, would do at three in the morning? Heck yeah, hundred mm-hmm. okay. percent. So credential stuffing is when you you look on the dark web and I see. Well, Carl's used the word dragon in his passwords everywhere on the internet. Let's see if it works here, mm-hmm. and we get we get lucky with the the basically using your past against mm. you. Yeah, and phishing uh, a phishing attack to garner credentials would be we send you a really really good looking email that says hey you know you need to log back into microsoft mm-hmm. blah 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 whatever you click a link and you come to our site yeah. and type in your username and password and sure enough we get access um so there's all sorts of ways to get usernames and passwords that are valid for the system mm-hmm. as if you're not implementing mfa if you don't have multi-factor authentication mm-hmm. we'll wait and you can go put it on right now okay <laughs> all right you can press pause <laughs> all right <laughs> And while you're doing that, we're going to take a little break. So we're going to pause here for a few important messages, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Security This Week. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Dwayne LaFlotte and Patrick Hines. 
And um, we've covered two out of our five stories, and I think we can probably blow through these in another 15 minutes. But uh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about Microsoft Authenticator. This is some good news, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, this is good news. There's a there's a an, a, an exhaustion attack that this we should help mitigate. Yeah. So the, so the, the, the uh, let's uh, talk about what this what this actually is. So Microsoft Authenticator now blocks suspicious MFA alerts by default. Um, and so if you're not, if you have a Microsoft account of any kind, mm-hmm. Office 365, Xbox, whatever, mm-hmm. um, you log into your computer with a Microsoft account, you should be using the Microsoft Authenticator period. Um, download it. It's free. Associate it with your account and you can go passwordless. Every time you go to log right. in to any service, it will pop up on your phone and say, Hey, is this you? And you can say, Yep, it's me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, what Patrick was alluding to, which is the MFA exhaustion attack, which sounds really fancy, yeah. right? Like, oh, this is an exhaustion attack. It probably is finding all of the cryptographic pairs it's me at the and gym every exhausting morning. them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you have to run a no. marathon. Yeah, an MFA marathon. What, a, what an exhaustion attack is, is at two in the morning, I will continually try and log into your Microsoft account mm. a bazillion mm-hmm. times. And it will pop up on your phone and pop up on your phone and pop up on your phone. And eventually you're so exhausted, you're like, whatever, and you click OK. Or you click the wrong button. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Microsoft has tried to mitigate this in, in two ways. Um, one, they now ask you for a number. Right. So when you go to log in, it says like, oh, the number's 47. Mm-hmm. And on your phone, it gives you four options. Yeah. And 47 is one of them. And you have to click the right option. So there they've made it 75% less likely that you're going to just click OK. Because you don't know what the number is. That's before this update. I mean, that that feature has been there for a while. That's before this update. Yeah, that's that's been on there for a while. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, what this update does is says, if we see that you're logging in from a place you haven't normally logged in from, mm-hmm. a place that, we, that you know, has a bad reputation, we're just not even going to show you. We're just not going to pop it up on your phone. Hmm. You can still go find those. Like if, for example, Patrick and I were doing some sort of secret op in North Korea and we had to log into our Microsoft accounts. Yep. Yeah, it's a suspicious place, but we can go to our phones, go to the authenticator and still see it and, and click. Yeah. Okay. I want to log in. Um, but it won't get pinged. It won't notify. Exactly. Mm. It won't notify you, which is uh, honestly is fantastic. Um, why is this important? You'd say who? Who would be silly enough to click OK on an authentication request mm. if you didn't try and authenticate? If I didn't try and log some log in and my authenticator pops up and says, is this you? Why, oh, why would I ever click yes? Because you maybe don't understand what they're asking you. You might not understand. You might be tired. Mm. Um, but the last two hacks I can think of, MGM and Uber, both of those hacks were because of this. Mm. They started with MFA exhaustion. Mm. They had a valid username and password. They tried to log into the network many, many, many times. Mm. And both engineers who are engineers clicked, yeah, that's fine. Okay, let it in. Mm. Right? Which just is, so it it happens. This is something that um, I think this is going to be a great idea for mitigating a lot of those attacks. Okay, cool. And uh, just remind us how to update uh, apps on your iPhone, for example. Do they auto- update automatically, or do you have to go to the App Store, look at it, and select update? Depends on the app. Um, there are a lot of apps that will update. Every time you open them, they'll check for an update. Mm. But for the most part, at least once a week, I'll go into the App Store and just mm. see all of my purchased apps. Click I do update. it every day. Really? Okay. Wow. Every day when I when I get on my phone, one of the things that I do is check to see if the world's on fire. And if it's not, I go to App you Store. Set the fire. I go to I go to things. <laughs> I I download to see all the updates. And I update them all. Yeah. Okay. So that's a that's a good point. Hey, remember how we've been talking about like updating iPhone, and we say automatically update, mm. automatically update, so on and so forth. Mm. And then Carl and I started talking back and forth, and I'm like, how come I every time I go into updates, there's an update, mm. and it didn't notify me, and it didn't apply it. Right. What's the deal? Yeah. Um, th- I downloaded for my my Apple iPhone. I downloaded Windows Defender. Huh. Windows Defender antivirus will run now on your iPhone. Huh. And it will route all web links through Defender's VPN. Oh, wow. So that they can look at all the web links you click on and make sure that they're not malicious. 
But the other thing it does is it will pop up a big warning on your phone every time you are out of date on Apple. And it says, hey, you should update to this latest version of Apple I like iOS that. right now. I need that. Yeah, I, I have it on. And honestly, I've been running it for a month and a half. And it's awesome. I've had yes, no issues yeah, with I'll it whatsoever. That. Yep. Definitely. And what I'm, what I'm wondering, I haven't dug into the stack yet. But what I'm wondering is if because they're routing all traffic through a VPN, mm-hmm. my guess is they'll also see all of the app traffic. Mm. So if the app is doing, if you download an app and it's doing something janky, whatever, mm. or talking to an IP address, it shouldn't. Wow. Right. Apple before is like, yeah, whatever. It's an app. It's in the store. And Defender's probably like, nah, you know what? No, I'm not going to allow it. Yeah. Hmm. No, I was, I was, I've been impressed with it. That plus lockdown mode plus shutting off regularly Mm -hmm. plus checking for updates daily. Mm. I think it'd be really hard to get. The only thing better is no phone at all. The only thing better would be what I do is (laughs) I take my iPhone. And every 24 hours, I uh, snap it in half and get a new uh, one. There and you then go. That's, you know, that works. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm just showing really, off. So I'm still living on, I'm still living in lockdown mode. Yeah. I, it's been that way since I that's got the awesome. newest iPhone. Mm-hmm. I'm impressed. Um, it works. And it also might be because I'm an old man and I don't you do as much with my phone <laughs> as I've had. There's a couple of things I've had to exempt from it, but sure. I won't share those here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but only one app and only one website. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. All right. Shall we talk about Russian hackers? Because we haven't talked about those guys in a while. Oh, it's been it's been days. Yeah. This has been days. It has They're been. So sure. Busy. What happened here? Um. So it's just new tactics and techniques. One of the things um I always like to talk about on this show is how do we kind of stay up on what's going on in the world from a general cyber sense. Mm-hmm. Um. And and. The attacks from attackers kind of range in multiple ways. One is they break into sites and whatnot, and they use very custom, you know, um, side-loaded DLLs Mm. that really are kind of hard for antivirus to see and that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, Another way that they will attack, though, is to do what's called LOTL, or living off the land. And, And that was one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this article. So the article says Russian hackers switch to living off the land technique to cause a power outage. Yeah, and and all living off the land, which is neat, all living off the land technique is, is when we break into an organization, break into a network, whatever, don't bring tools with us. Mm -hmm. Let's just use what's there. Use what's there. Let's use PowerShell. Let's use... Less likely to be detected. Yeah, Windows user administration, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Let's use... When I'm breaking into a SQL server, you know what I use? SQL Server Management Studio. Mm -hmm. Because it's allowed to run and it's allowed to connect to SQL servers. Right. So, um, so this, this tactic, although not new, um, we're seeing, uh, Russian attackers when attacking SCADA systems, which are systems that control power grids and that sort of stuff. Remember we talked about, um, OT operational technology. Yeah. SCADA is one of them. Um, you know, they're switching over to, hmm, you know what? We'll probably be detected less if we just use the functions that are built into a SCADA system. So let's do that. Um, so, you know, the, the warning here is a lot of people will download some like CrowdStrike or whatever, some really advanced detectable, you know, endpoint detection, yeah. that sort of stuff. And none of this is going to get detected because it, it literally, they're all signed binaries that are running from in the way they're supposed to run, but can still do damage. Hmm. Okay. So the recommendation there is, okay. A, don't rely on just your your endpoint detection systems to do, you know, to protect you against everything. And B, make sure you're running with least privilege. Um, that way, if somebody does try and use a native executable, if the account that they have doesn't have access to do that, doesn't matter. Of course, if they're in there with a priv ask, you're screwed. Eh, yeah, a level 10 priv ask, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven. Does this go up to eleven? Yes, level yes, it eleven. Does. <laughs> okay, shall we talk about the clickbait story here? Please. I was using uh, ChatGPT four the other day, and then all of a sudden, I got something seems to be wrong. Please try later, and it was for two hours. And I looked at OpenAI's, um, you know. Uh, meter of you know outages and it was definitely out it was out for Mm. a few hours uh just a couple of days ago and so now there's an article that says OpenAI confirms it was a distributed denial of service attack and and this just 
one day after they announced this new version of ChatGPT, let me tell you what uh, this new version, uh, it's called ChatGPT4 Turbo. Um, it has 128K context day in memory, which is amazing. Wow. The, it, yeah, they slashed awesome. the price by one third and the uh, the data is trained up to March 2023. Wow. So it's it's quite amazing. On top of that, they consolidated, they recently did this too, they consolidated all of the, you know, the beta stuff, the API and the plugins and all of that into a single monolithic kind of model. So it's a multi-model. And um, yeah, and it does a really great job of all the things that you like to use it for. Um, there's new DALI stuff, so new image uh, generation, and uh, a whole bunch of new things for uploading your own data and, um, and, and querying it. So that's the thing that we need to make sure we understand the connotations of uploading your own data. Mm. Mm. What's the protection guarantee of that data? Is there a p- potential for someone to question the model to then get access to your data. No, no. In in all of these situations and and Google Bard is the same way that gives you access to your your drive uh, as a vector database. Basically, they've ingested and in Office 365 has done the same thing. They ingest all your 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 documents into a vector database and you can search it, but it's only for you. They do not train the model on your data. And it's the same with OpenAI. So you, it's your little sandbox to play in. Bus- businesses have another problem that, and that requires what you know is emerging as a technology called an AI firewall, mm. which is we may let's say the three of us are part of a large corporation and we have a corpus of data that we want to have the AI ingest for our use, mm. right? There's data that I might not have access to, but Dwayne and you do. Mm. So when I make a query, we need the AI to understand that it can't give me an answer using information I'm not privy to. Right. So that's an emerging um, aspect of what we're, we're calling the AI firewall right now. And um, more on that when, when it starts to mature. But I think next year you're going to hear that term quite a bit. I'll link to that. And you heard it here first. AI firewall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that was uh, a little bit um what's what's the word I want? Anticlimactic, maybe? I know, right? I mean, it's cool. The the open AI stuff's cool and and this was um the outage was actually caused it was denial of service. Uh mm. I believe it was by anonymous Sudan. Um but uh, which uh, that group is also uh, denial of service to OneDrive, Office.com, mm. et cetera. So, um, so not a new tactic for them. Not sure why exactly they were targeting hmm. uh, OpenAI, but um, I don't know. It, it depressed me because, you know what? I love using OpenAI and, and ChatGPT for a lot of things. And one of the things I love using it for hmm. is um, actually there's two things. One is... When taking a piece of code that I haven't written in a language I'm not working right. with all the time. Convert it to a language you can, yeah. I love putting it in chat GPT. Yeah, and saying, can you convert this to C Sharp, which I'm really good right. at. Or can you just explain what this is doing? Yeah. Um, that's one one way I use it. Another way I use it is um, actually to help the kids with homework. Hmm. Um, they're like, they're doing, you're part of the problem. That's right. No, no, no. But they're doing like, they're, they'll be doing some sort of the chat GPT call is coming. From Dwayne is raising house. dumb <laughs> kids. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. We're worried now. They'll, they'll be Dwayne. like, Hey, can you help me with this, with this physics? And I'm like, I haven't looked at physics in a long time. So I'll be, so I'll go to chat GPT and I'll be like, can you explain this formula yeah, to yeah. me? And I'm like, Oh, I get it. I get it. Okay, cool. Okay. And then I can go over and be like, okay, this All is all right. You. So you don't say, Hey kids, here's chat GPT. Go. Go, go to it homework wise oh dear god no no actually i've cautioned them quite a bit yeah. like hey listen chat gpt is like a, it's like a calculator mm-hmm. right um if your teacher says don't use calculators then you shouldn't use calculators because on the test you're not gonna have a calculator mm-hmm. and there's no guarantee you're gonna get the right answer yeah and that's the most important thing i've been uh, doing a new podcast with brian mckay called the ai bot show podcast we've only done two episodes and we might change the name but it's at the right now 
And uh, the episode 13, we just talked about all the changes that happened last week from the announcement of the new OpenAI and stuff. And one of the things that they have in the API, and they've had this for a while, is if you're using the API Playground, let's say, or you're using the API from C Sharp or whatever, um, you c- you have this dial called temperature, right? Hmm. And temperature, when it goes up, is how likely is it to hallucinate? Oh, wow. Yeah. So if, hmm. if, if you get the temperature down to the point where um, the same prompt will yield the same exact, you know, result every time, then it it's targeting accuracy. But if you raise that temperature, and I can't remember which way it goes, but if you change that value, it'd be more or less likely to hallucinate and to give you uh, creative solutions. You know, huh. In other words, it won't pick the the vector that it should pick. It'll pick one with a sh- slightly sm- uh, lower weight when it's picking the next word. It's got like surprise me. It's kind of like the search engine <laughs> yeah. surprise me. Yeah, it's kind of like the <laughs> which I've never the used the dementia button. You know, I've never right? used that. I've I've never been like. I'm 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 on a web browser. Surprise me! I no interest. Yeah, you know I I, I, I had know. I, I had a training company for a while before I had App Phoenix, and I had a sales guy working for me, and he was pushing me to to have us buy an ad so that when somebody clicked surprise me, our link would come up, and I'm like, no, oh my God. are you kidding? No. That's the dumbest no. thing I ever heard. Oh, surprise me. Yeah. Did he dislike money? Apparently, he just wanted to find a new angle, you know. <laughs> Did he dislike money? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. Tell a friend about security this week. We need more listeners. Otherwise, uh, I don't know. But maybe we may have to stop doing it because nobody's listening. I'm kind of stink. So we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.